Matthew Gardner is the Chief Economist for Windermere Real Estate and is responsible for analyzing and interpreting economic data and its impact on the real estate market on both the local and national level. Matthew has over 28 years of professional experience in both the U.S. and the U.K. In addition to this, he chairs the Board of Trustees at the Washington Center for Real Estate Research and is on the advisory board at the Runstead Department of Real Estate at the University of Washington. Matthew, thanks for coming on with us today. Thanks Delighted to be here. Thank you. Well, Matthew, we're uh, before we jump into grilling you here, we want to warm you up with a few softballs. So if we could begin, if you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got connected to the UW real estate program. Uh, sure. Uh, background uh, is, I, I guess, for some people interesting. Well, it is for me anyway. Uh, and it really kind of goes back to when I went up to Oxford uh, from undergrad in, in economics. And my mother said, what the heck are you going to do with an economics degree? And I said, well, mum, I mean, any decision you make, quite frankly, has got an economic principle behind it. Therefore, I should always have a job. At which point she said, great, go forth, you're in good shape. But I, I think what she didn't quite uh, come to terms with was the fact that I enjoyed it so much that I ended up staying in school for almost 10 years um, at Oxford, then uh, LSE, London School of Economics, after that to get my uh, my uh, advanced degrees. So uh, background in, in economics, I came over to the States uh, back in the early 1990s. And I've been traveling here quite a lot because once I'd uh, decided to get a real job, I ended up working for a company uh, actually back in Oxford. And uh, they were what's called kind of land surveyors and managers. And uh, my company, Clutton's, managed estates for the Church of England, the royal family and what have you. And that brought me across this uh, America fairly frequently because you didn't get it all back in 1776. <laughs> we kept rather large bits uh, of, of, of uh, America. And it's actually my one and only lifelong NDA that I can't talk about. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I came across the States fairly frequently. Uh, I was already involved in real estate. And I came to visit my sister, who was actually working for Microsoft back then, uh, early days. Uh, she's uh, long retired by now. And uh, I looked in Seattle and said, well, who analyzes real estate? And to be honest with you, certainly on the residential side, no one really did. Uh, developers kind of licked their finger, looked around and said, OK, we'll build this. And so I said, OK, well, uh, what if I was to kind of hang my shingle out and try and advise uh, these developers what they should build? Will it be successful? And that led me to decide to move from the UK, uh, stay in Seattle and uh, been here ever since. And as far as the university is concerned, wow, that goes back a long way. I was asked to join the advisory board uh, for the Runstead Department. Oh, it must be 10, 15 years ago now. And so from that, uh, I met a lot of people, obviously, uh, at the university. They asked me would I come in and give guest, uh, guest lectures, um, both the undergraduate mm -hmm. and graduate departments. And uh, that's been my relationship ever since. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Great. So pivoting over to Windermere, help us to understand your role at Windermere. Right. Well, the relationship with Windermere is interesting. I mean, I, I'd been a consultant for a, a long 15 years at that point, and Windermere was one of my earliest clients. And uh, they came on board with me back in the late 1990s. And I was consulting with them and with the owners, the Jacoby family, uh, as well as uh, a number of the owners of the offices. And uh, it's after about 50, about 2015, no, wrong, about 2010, Obi Jacoby, uh, one of the uh, co-presidents of Windermere, has said, well, would you come and join us? And I'm like, I, I really don't play well with others, so uh, no. Um, uh, however, after five years, uh, we actually decided, we, we figured out how that would look, and I joined the firm five years ago. And so what I've really got is about 300 offices, about 6,700 agents or brokers, depending on where you are in the country, and they sell roughly about $41 billion worth of homes every year. And uh, my job is both outward facing as well as inward facing outward to advise our agents on what's really going on, what's impacting real estate so they can advise their clients in the most appropriate way. And internally, uh, my job really is kind of looking at where we should be looking to expand 
at the company, where are markets we might want to think about growing into. So as uh, Windermere is the largest privately held real estate brokerage in the Western United States, uh, I've got a, a lot of markets which I can really kind of focus in on. We're in 11 states right now. And, uh, and so I, I, I enjoy helping out our agents and our owners and advising them what, what the heck is going on uh, in respect to not just housing, but obviously the economy, because the two walk hand in hand with each other. Yes. Well, so we're in Washington. We're about a year into the uh, stay home, stay healthy order, uh, hopefully coming out of it. But uh, so tell us about your thoughts on the, you know, we're extremely hot in our residential real estate market. What do you see coming up and going forward? Are people going to stay working at home or what do you see coming up? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it's been, it's funny. Uh, on the 15th of this month, uh, I would have been working from my home for one year uh, that I've not been in an office. So it, it's been a, a big change as it has for everyone, quite frankly. But what is particularly interesting, if you go all the way back to mid-February, early March, when this really kicked in, a lot of people were saying, it's going to be the demise of the housing market. Housing market is going to collapse. It's going to be horrible. Uh, we're going to see a bunch of foreclosures, all this normal stuff. Yet housing really last year has been one of the few shining lights through this pandemic period. Mass amount of demand for lots of different reasons. And so as we move along, as we come out of this, what's been interesting is that one, housing has been remarkably robust. I'm talking about housing, ownership housing, the apartment market. Well, that's a different world, certainly today. But the uh, ownership market has done extraordinarily well. I think it is going to continue to do that. And you mentioned about the work from home. And I think that's going to be fascinating over the course of the next several years to see how that actually evolves. And you mentioned work from home. Well, we, we tried work from home back in the 1990s, believe it or not, late 90s. It's going to be the panacea. It's going to be the solve all, uh, of all our issues. It's going to help traffic congestion. It's going to be wonderful. And it failed. It failed horribly for two, in essence, two reasons. From the uh, business owner's perspective, well, they thought we were watching daytime TV and, and, uh, uh, and not working. And from the employee's perspective, as much as they initially thought, great, kind of roll out of bed in your bunny slippers uh, down to your office and, and away you go. But it didn't work uh, for them because they missed that symbiosis. We are social creatures, social beings. And they miss kind of being around people and having those conversations in hallways where you come up with, with different ideas. So it failed then. This time around, I don't think it's going to fail. I think it's going to be, be a success. And I think it's going to be ongoing. However, it's not going to be black and white. And what do I mean by that? It's not a case that we'll be working from home full time or working from an office full time. What I believe that a lot of people will end up doing is working maybe two or three days a week at an office or two or three days a week at home. And so it's going to be that blend because by getting that blend, they're enjoying certainly working from home. But going into an office, again, we are social creatures. So you can still have that, uh, that relationship with, with your colleagues. And from the business owner's perspective, their concerns right now are not the fact we're not working. We have Zoom that we can prove that now. But it's more uh, the fact that their worries about training uh, is going to be an issue for them. But it's also uh, productivity. And what I mean by that is that back in the day, for example, if, uh, if one of our co-presidents had a question, they came to my office door, asked it, walked away three minutes later. Well, that has now turned into a 30-minute Zoom call. So productivity actually can, can, can go down. Ultimately, what do I expect? Well, I think that we will certainly see more people working from home, as I said, mainly part-time as opposed to full-time. And what that can allow people to do, potentially, is to move out of the very expensive markets here in Seattle, or even indeed in King County, and move further out. And they will put up with a lousy commute because they can get a lot more house for a lot less money, and, uh, and that, I think, is something which we are going to see going forward is the rise of the suburbs. Mm. There's a couple of other reasons why I think that people will move as well. A lot of people just don't have a dedicated workspace. I know I don't. I'm working for my dining room table. And so if you don't have that, without a doubt, I believe that we will find some people moving because they really need that space if they believe that they're going to be working from home uh, a, a quite a lot uh, of the time. And uh, if you think about housing prices, well, housing prices are higher the closer to the job centers you get. 
which makes sense because there's a value to our time. But if we don't have to be on that commute five days a week, well, yeah, you will move further out. It certainly is significantly cheaper as you go either north into Snohomish, uh, west into Kitsap, or even going down south into Pierce County. But I don't expect people to move out to Yakima, uh, not seeing that happening. So I think that uh, the changes we've seen through the pandemic are actually ones which are going to have legs. They're going to have traction and they are going to continue, uh, I believe, for a, a very long time. I want to jump back real quick to something you mentioned early on in the conversation, which was when you were first coming to the United States in the 90s, there wasn't a lot of analysis going in, at least in the residential side of the mm. house. So one of the things you said was people were kind of licking their fingers, sticking it in the air. And in a previous conversation, you mentioned the philosophy that if we build it, they will come. But how has that changed today? And more importantly, why has that changed? Why yeah. did that change? Uh, and you're right. And I think that it's been fascinating to look at the comparison, certainly back in the day, between residential and commercial. And the commercial side, uh, and even including income properties, apartments, there was a lot of analysis done uh, on all these projects. And yet there really wasn't in the residential world. Now, why has that changed? Or well, just purely cost. I mean, uh, if you think about housing in aggregate, it's worth about, in America, 32, 33 trillion dollars. It, it's a massive amount of money. And so we're not, we're not talking about chump change here. And there's a, a, a lot of concerns, which, which we really saw coming out of the burst in the housing bubble. And that is because banks are naturally far more cautious now than they used to be. So a builder can't go to a bank and say, lend me all this money so I can build a housing estate and just kind of be given an open check. And because of that, it now requires a lot more thought, uh, a lot more analysis uh, because of, of purely because of the risk factors associated with it. So uh, given that there is so much money involved uh, and certainly banks are still cautious and they, it makes sense for them to do it. Also developers, they've got to have skin in the game now. You can't over leverage as we saw back before the burst in the housing bubble. I mean, builders are great at a thing called OPM, right? Other people's money, great spenders of it. Well, now you can probably borrow 62, 63% uh, of construction costs, you've got to have some skin in the game. So even developers now are being more thoughtful and they now require far more robust analysis as to whether a project does make sense or not. And we're very lucky here, quite frankly, a majority of projects do, but uh, I do remember certainly when I was back uh, in uh, uh, with my own company, telling some, de de some builders who hired me to, to an analyze a potential development, like, no, you, it's silly, don't do this. Now, they, they hate me for, for a while for me saying that, but then ultimately a few months later, they said, OK, well, maybe you're right now. But now look at this one. So I, I think that it has seen a, a very significant evolution. And that is certainly now trickling down into academia. Now, well, naturally, there are a, a lot of universities who are fairly robust when it comes to real estate research. I mean, at Harvard, obviously, the Joint Center for Real Estate Studies, I I worked there for a short while. It is very good. Obviously, we have one up here at UW, down at Texas, so uh, USC as well. So there are, uh, and I think it has trickled down uh, into the collegiate level. So I think we're now starting to get a fairly robust number uh, of people, students interested in real estate uh, and interested in real estate analysis. So it's, it's about time. And kind of a follow on to that as well. So you mentioned Residential developers today, they got to give the lenders a little bit of a warm and fuzzy skin of the game is definitely part of that. But can you talk a little more specifically about what analysis is being done? How are they building the case? What metrics are they looking at to get those lenders on board with their projects? Right. Um, well, depending on obviously what, what asset you're talking about, uh, naturally, I think in any market or, or any product, uh, residentially speaking, you've got to look at you know, if we build it or if you build it, will people come? So you've got to start looking at demographics. And demographics is a very, very significant component of real estate analysis. And most particularly now, and I say now, why do I do that? Well, think about millennials, think about you guys. And uh, we have a massive wave of millennials who are starting to turn 30 over the next couple of years. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means they're gonna start segueing out uh, of the cool, hip urban apartment. They're getting into real relationships, getting married, and uh, I think we're going to see a lot of demand from that, that age cohort. We're going to see that for several years. So demographics is important. Naturally, the economy is important as well. 
I mean, the reason why housing prices go up here in Seattle, for example, at a far brisker pace and certainly to a far higher level than you'd see maybe in um, Columbus, Ohio, uh, it is because of the robust job market that we have. So you need to look at economics uh, in terms of what's going on with employment, what's going on with salaries, because there must always be a relationship between housing prices and incomes. What is going on with the mortgage markets? And that is very important, certainly now. I mean, we've seen a re over the last couple of weeks a fairly significant spike in mortgage rates, which people are getting worried about. I mean, it put everything in perspective, right? We're still down around 3%. So, it, so what's going to be the future of mortgages? What's happening there? And it's amazing how many people don't understand how a mortgage is calculated and what it tracks. So I think there's a, a lot of things you need to look at in that respect. Obviously, you also need to look at land use, look at land availability. That impacts it as well. So because we have urban growth boundaries here, which was a program put in place back in 1990, which basically said that uh, you know, we want to prevent urban or well, suburban sprawl, and therefore we're going to limit where you can build and where you cannot build. And so if you limit your land supply, that in turn pushes up prices, which is a situation very different from, let's say, Houston, where you've got as much land as you want. And anytime Houston has a traffic jam, they build a ring road around it, uh, or at least another one. So uh, land use is important, demographics important. Um, Finance is important. Uh, general uh, economic stability is important. One of the growth areas is, again, think back here to, let's say, the early 1970s. What happened then was, well, we went where Boeing went. If Boeing was doing well, then we were doing well. When they weren't, then, then we weren't. So, in fact, we had that big uh, bust in Boeing in 1972. The following year was the last year we lost population. People, more people moved out than moved in. So you also have to look at what are the drivers for a local economy as well. And ultimately, and also equally as important, what are you going to build? What is it that people want? And will there be sufficient demand for it to meet the additional supply that you're going to be bringing on board? So there's so many different components to it. And obviously, you need to look at forecasting mortgage rates because any development is going to take some time to build. So the rates might be at 3% now, but maybe in two years' time or three years' time, they might be significantly higher. How is that going to impact not just demand, but most importantly, price? You see, for every one percentage point increase in mortgage rates, people can afford to pay 10% less for a house. So uh, there, there's lots of forecasting that has to come into it as well, uh, mainly based around incomes uh, and certainly based around mortgage rates as well and population growth and uh, organic economic growth as well. And looking real quickly at mm. Seattle area specifically, you mentioned the, the urban growth boundary. Mm -hmm. We're already in Black Diamond. We're in North Bend. We're in Bothell. Where, where else is there to go in the area? And that is a, a great question. And it is my biggest worry. And people, if anyone was to ask me what, what keeps me awake at night, it is one thing, housing affordability. And Imagine, kind of go back to your Econ 501 classes, right? If you limit supply because we haven't got that much land, yet you've got growth, population growth and economic growth, therefore you've got higher demand, what happens to prices? Well, they rise. And that's very obvious. And we are in a situation, quite frankly, you mentioned Black Diamond. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the final two, I believe, master plan communities that we are ever going to see here. I mean, I remember back in the day working for Warehouser uh, as a client, and uh, analyzing their three big master plans they had, uh, North West Landing, Redmond Ridge, and Snoqualmie Ridge. So we had those, and we had Esquire Highlands and several others. But uh, once we get through these last two projects, uh, Black Diamond and one, Cascadia down by Bonnie Lake, that's it. And so we, we can't create any more land. And so the problem, given that, is where are you going to build? And on the land that is left, it makes it remarkably expensive. I mean, you, you can buy a single family finished lot ready to build in Bothell, that's going to cost you $400,000, which means the house you have to build on it has got to be valued at probably high millions, high one million, uh, one six, one seven to make a margin. I, mean, I like Bothell. I'm not sure I'd like million seven Bothell. So uh, it's, uh, it is a significant issue. So we're not, we're not going to create any more land. We're not going to, we're, we're limited by water, by mountains. So how can we change it? I mean, you can't fill in Elliott Bay. 
And so uh, uh, what do I think? We need to look at zoning inside our urban growth boundaries. And there's no political will to expand those boundaries at all. I spend a lot of time down in Olympia uh, arguing with state senators about this very issue. And quite frankly, that most of them don't care. I mean, the senator from Ferry County, for example, will say, I've got a hundred years worth of land out ahead of me, doesn't matter. Well, think about it this way. Half of the population of Washington state live in the tri-county area, King Pierce and Snohomish. So that is where, that's where the demand is, but that's not where the supply is. So we need, if we're not gonna expand those boundaries, which we are very, uh, it's very unlikely, then we need to look at zoning within those boundaries. Now, zoning in the residential sector was created uh, in Washington State back in 1938. So it's, it, might, it made sense then. It made sense through the probably the 60s. Does it make sense now? No. And so we need to start to figure out how we can add density uh, into our markets. And that makes sense logically. It makes sense to me. The trouble is you have uh, a significant uh, pushback, shall we say, from existing neighbors in those areas. You see, we are remarkably liberal here. I mean, we want to embrace affordable housing. Housing for everyone is great. Just don't build it next to me. And, uh, and that's, that's a big issue. So we have this NIMBY, not in my backyard, right? So we need to turn NIMBYs into YIMBYs, yes, in my backyard. And uh, that is, the I think, the only way we're going to address it. And it's very, very important. And the, and the reason why it's important is that imagine if you are a business owner and you're thinking about expanding into the Seattle area. Well, what are the two things you think about more than anything else? Well, I'll tell you. One of which is, is there, a, is there an educated workforce I can hire? Well, check that box. In fact, uh, Seattle as a city is number one when it comes to the, uh, the percentage of residents that have at least a bachelor's degree or higher of any city in the country. So we, we are wickedly smart. That, so check that box. But the second thing that they worry about is how much do I have to pay people? And what's the biggest component of, of salaries? Cost of living. So at what point are they going to say, well, I've got to pay people how much just to afford to live somewhere or have a, a roof over their heads? Well, at what point are they going to say, no, I can't, that doesn't make sense. And if we start seeing that, and quite frankly, we already are, well, then markets like Spokane, Washington, Boise, Idaho, even Las Vegas, Nevada can become more attractive to them. Why? Well, in any of those three markets, you can buy a brand new, never lived in single family home for $350,000. Good luck finding a shoebox in Seattle for that. So uh, it is something which I don't think we are spending enough time or enough energy on trying to address. So housing affordability is a, a big, big thing for me. And the only way we can address that increased supply, which is needed to slow down the price growth, is to build more can't build more because you've run out of land. So you've got to look at changing zoning. We're seeing it in other parts of the country already. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for example, you can now build uh, duplexes, uh, triplex, four packs, or even six unit projects inside any single family zone area in the city. Now, that was one, that's only one city, but the state of Oregon just implemented exactly the same plan across the entire state. Now, it doesn't kick into play until may of 2022 but at least they are thinking along those lines we need to do that here and when you say we need to do that my thought is jeff and i are out in kent's so we're pretty far south of seattle so you don't need to do that out here do you but realistically how far out does the zone need to change is it tacoma is it the whole tri-county area is it specifically in seattle what are your thoughts well i mean certainly uh, city of seattle itself absolutely i mean if you look at residential uh, zone land here in the city uh, 70 percent, seven zero percent of it is zoned single family. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's an area from Northgate down to South Center. It's it makes no sense to do that. So I think certainly in the urban markets, it's going to be important to look at that. Uh, I'd also likely say Bellevue as well. Uh, uh, do you need it down in Kent? Well, again, it's you're running out of land down in Kent as well. So it's not as if you're creating any more down there. So I, I think it's something which we're not. I, I'd be surprised to see it arbitrarily done. Uh, across the region, mainly because jurisdictions themselves are responsible for that, and uh, the state can't mandate uh, that change, at least right now. There are ways that they can, uh, based upon uh, Growth Management Act and uh, and the Buildable Lands Analysis, which all counties are required to do every, every couple of years. And by doing that, you see, what when, when GMA was implemented, 
it said, okay, you have to have 20 years worth of land ahead of you, given the forecast for population growth provided by the Puget Sound Regional Council. Now, every county uh, is saying, oh, it's great, got it covered. Well, actually, you don't, because the methodology behind the buildable lands analysis is, in my opinion, fatally flawed. Uh, it includes lots which, quite frankly, no one's going to build on or couldn't afford to build on land away from infrastructure or all, all these issues. So uh, if we actually change the methodology, and I'm actually working with UW right now to, to create a new methodology to do that, and it says we don't have enough land, well, that uh, there's an impact to that. Uh, and the impact is that then flips a switch, basically, uh, which allows the state to say, OK, no, we have to make changes now to meet this. So I think I'm hopeful at some point we will see that occurring, but we can need to, to really understand that we have a shortfall of housing, we have a shortfall of land, and the way we've been looking at it over the last 30 years just is quite frankly wrong. Great. Well, talk about wickedly smart. That's amazing amount of information you've just uh, given us. So thank you for that. So pivoting a little bit, when you're not doing economics and all this stuff you're doing, what, what do you enjoy doing? What's your favorite book, hobby, charity? What do you like to do in your spare time? Oh, wait, what spare time? Um, uh, well, in terms of hobby, uh, well, I, I'll tell you one thing I do, uh, do and that is every August, um, a friend and I, we've done this for the last decade now, believe it or not, uh, we take off to the northern tip uh, of uh, Vancouver Island and uh, we take our kayaks and we go kayaking for about 10 days and we basically disappear off. Um, at, there are no hotels. We just we paddle for eight, 10 hours a day, find a beach, stay there. And, uh, and you really kind of get off grid, you disappear. And for me, it's something which I, I, I have to do. It, it just makes Make your pussy back in a, a reset pattern, shall we say? So, uh, ocean kayaking uh, is a big thing that I, I thoroughly enjoy doing, and it's a, one. It's a lot of fun, but you can really disappear, and I don't see, we don't see, rather, another human being literally uh, for a couple of weeks, which is nice. Uh, lots of animals, lots of bears and, and cougars and what have you, uh, but it's uh, it's great to get away. So, uh, in terms of what do I enjoy doing, getting away uh, it is certainly something every summer which I I will keep on doing until my my shoulders say that I can't anymore. Uh, in terms of um, books, well, um, well, actually, I've just finished. I just reread, uh, it, given what we've been talking about, you might find it interesting, uh, a, a really old book, uh, Milton Freeman and George Stigler's uh, Roofs or Ceilings, The Current Housing Problem. And that was a book, believe it or not, that was written back in 1945, but still very applicable uh, today as it was back then. Uh, and again, we're here, we talk about not just housing affordability, but uh, rent control. Uh, and it's a, a big, big issue. We're starting to see that word be brought up again. So I thought it was worthwhile reminding myself of, of what Friedman said, although I will tell you, I'm a Keynesian economist, so Friedman and me tend not to get on too well. Um, uh, other than that, uh, the other bedside table books that I have right now are 100 Years of Zoning and the Future of Cities, and that's a La Harvey's great book that he wrote about a decade ago. And um, what else? Oh, yeah, uh, Zoned Out, um, uh, Race, Displacement and, and city, city Planning in New York, uh, which is uh, Angotti and, and Morse's book. Uh, this, I think it's really interesting to read what other people, how they are looking at housing and housing cost and certainly displacement. You see, obviously, the same thing in New York as we do here. People pushed further and further out. So it's uh, I try and read. I don't get a chance, I'm afraid, to read as much as I should. But those are a couple of the books which uh, I always tend to go back to every few years because I find them, quite frankly, fascinating. Uh, charity, well, Fred Hutch uh, is a charity. It's very near and dear to my heart. I lost my mother to cancer and my sister, both, my sister had cancer as well, now recovering. And so Fred Hutch is uh, a group which I support avidly and have done uh, for many, many years. Good. Well, thanks for that. And and talk about uh, you know economics and stuff and all the things you have to share. If people want to follow your updates, how can people follow you? Where do you have your uh, economic updates for Windermere? How do they sure. see those? Um, best thing is probably follow Windermere Economics on Facebook, uh, also uh, on Instagram. And uh, Seattle Econ on Twitter uh, is my Twitter handle. So it's, uh, it's, in, it's funny because uh, when you look at social media now and just the availability of, of, of data and information, I follow a lot of amazing, these smart minds out there. And it's great now to have almost a, a real time discussion with some of these people because I mean, economics, it's, 
it, it touches everything, uh, lit quite literally. And housing being, in my opinion, an, an organic good, uh, is we've always needed shelter, right? Ever since we crawled out of the primordial ooze, we found a rock to hide under, uh, we, and we will always need shelter. What's it going to look like? Where is it going to be? And how do we see that interaction between people and places? And how are cities of the future going to look? And I think the pandemic has, if there's a positive out of it, beyond the fact the housing market, I think naturally has been a, a shining light, as I mentioned earlier on. But I think hopefully it might have focused our attention on some of the issues there are around housing, issues around homelessness, issues around affordability, but not just that, uh, around retail. If there's an asset class I worry about today, as we come out, hopefully the pandemic is bricks and mortar retail. Is it going to survive? Is it going to change? Uh, will it make it through? And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of mom and pop stores out there who are suffering dramatically uh, with, with lower revenues. How many are going to stay open? Are we also going to see that, as I mentioned, uh, that flight out to the suburbs again? You see, last couple of decades, we've actually been moving into cities. Are we going to see a move out because of the ability to work from home? So uh, I think a lot of books are going to be written about this. In fact, I've got two friends of mine that have already started writing books about housing and the pandemic, uh, one here and one in the UK. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to get any real data now. It's going to be a while. I mean, we haven't got the 2020 census data out yet, and that's just been delayed again. So I think the 2021 uh, census data, which we will get uh, through the American Community Survey, is going to be really interesting to see how much of a migration did we see? Did we really see people disappear out into the wild blue yonder? Or did they, as I believe, just move somewhat further out? So uh, I think that uh, the future of, of real estate and certainly of housing is going to be fascinating to look at from that perspective. But also, are we going to start seeing some adaptive reuse? Uh, are we going to see existing um, projects or, or asset classes change? And what do I mean by that? Well, there are people who are talking about converting offices. Right? Some people out there believe that the office market is going to be decimated because of work from home. Therefore, we should take these high rises and convert them into housing. Well, not going to work. Uh, for lots of reasons I could get into about uh, core depth and plumbing penetration, these kinds of things, but I don't see that occurring. However, on the retail side, do I see regional malls potentially be converted like we're already seeing up in Northgate into mixed use projects? Yeah. I mean, for the last several years, I've been saying that uh, you know, we are going to lose half of our regional malls in the next decade or so. And I think that's going to be true. Strip malls, on, on the other hand, we're, we're not overdeveloped when it comes to strip malls. We're just under demolished. Uh, they, they make no sense. And so I think we could see some of those likely not survive, and those could be converted into uh, single-use, possibly residential projects. And finally, well, we know the hotel sector is suffering dramatically. I don't say that we're going to see a, a, a whole bunch of Marriott's convert uh, into residential, but motels, inns, I think it wouldn't be surprising to me at all to see some of those uh, drop out uh, of the... Uh, uh, that kind of uh, leisure and hosp hospitality uh, industry and come into a different type of residential use. So as we go through the next probably decade, how is it going to look? How is it going to change? How are, are we going to use offices in the same manner? Are we going to now start going back into private offices and away from the, uh, the bullpen scenarios, which a lot uh, of companies moved to over the course of the last couple of decades? So I think it's, there's, a, there's a lot of very exciting things as an analyst that I'll be keeping close tabs on seeing what is that evolution? What does it look like? Uh, and it's going to be remarkable uh, to watch over the course of the next, I said, probably the next decade or so. Yeah, I think exciting, scary, opportunistic. So I think the overall thing is people should follow you. We'll put a link to your site on here so they can get uh, your regular updates and uh, put it to put it to you. So we want to say thank you so much for coming on today oh, and very sharing welcome. just so much information. Thank you. You're thank very, you very, very welcome. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Appreciate the invitation. Anytime you're welcome to come back. Okay.